29, the outlook for Coach Mal Stevens and Captain Furpo Green was anything but brilliant until a little guy named Booth, the Mighty Might, 144 pounds, gave the crowds thrills they will never forget. Army was ahead 13 to nothing on an interception by Chris Cagle, one of the established stars of the day. And a 50-yard drive, a pass, Cagle to Merle, another All-American, and Merle, 30 yards for the score. Then Albie, wearing the number 48 he made famous, went in for his first big game in the bowl. It was Booth for 13 yards. Booth for six. Booth to the one-yard line, and Booth going over for the touchdown. Booth kicking the try for point. In the second half, Booth and Taylor, number 42, alternated on another drive with Booth hurling himself over for his second touchdown. And again kicking the point. Next time he got the ball, Albie showed just how spectacular he could be. Taking Merle's punt on his own 33-yard line, he faked out a couple of tacklers, picked up some good blocks, and with Tuffy Phillips blotting out Cagle, went over, standing up. Techniques for slowing down pictures like this are not too good, but it's worth seeing again anyway. Booth frustrating the mighty, not too fast, just shifty and slippery. The little man who wasn't there when the Giants tried to grab him. His drop kick wound up the scoring. Booth 21, Army 13. Next week, after some fine passing by Al Marsters, Dartmouth was leading 12 to 10 as twilight fell late in the game. sidelined for a year by a knee injury, intercepted Tommy Longnecker's pass, and praying all the way that his knee would hold up, went 85 yards to keep the old bowl jinx alive. The film is poor, but it merits another look. The game was nearly over. Dartmouth was in control. And then the jinx took the ball to Yale's fastest man. Albie always said this was his greatest thrill in football. Even without Booth, this was quite a team. Against Princeton, Chick McLennan took the injured Albies place, and with Green, Lozer, and Vincent opening holes, spearheaded a 10 to nothing victory. Albie was elected captain in 1931 and continued his spectacular career. Against Dartmouth, he ran 94 yards with a kickoff for a new bowl record. two-yard pass from Todd. And went 54 yards off tackle for a third touchdown. But this was a crazy game. Yale led 33 to 10 in the third quarter. When Dartmouth's Wild Bill McCall took a kickoff and nearly equaled Booth's new record with a 92-yard run for a score. And the Dartmouth team came alive in earnest. McCall intercepted a pass and ran 70 yards. Dartmouth scored on a block kick. Morton placed kick for a 33-33 tie and the bowl jinx held for another year. Again, Aldi missed the Princeton game, but Clem and Charlie Williamson combined on a lateral for a 45-yard touchdown. Bob Lassiter ran 95 yards on a kickoff to break Aldi's record before it was a month old. And 
Bud Parker scored on a 63-yard punt return as the team ran up a record score of 51-14. Barry Wood, Harvard's superb quarterback, was Booth's greatest rival. And in 1931, undefeated Harvard figured to make it three in a row against Little Boy Blue. The first few seconds made their confidence look good. Wood took the kickoff in the end zone, handed off to Prickard on the 12-yard line. Prickard cut to the right. Far across the field, Ernie Barris yells right in, started to run diagonally down the field, and with a desperate lunge, knocked Prickard out of bounds on Yale's seven. scoreless deadlock until late in the fourth quarter. Pauley blocked Wood's punt on the Harvard 45-yard line. Then Booth fought desperately for yardage, a six-yard smash. A pass to Barris on the 12-yard line. to the 10. Another to the 5. And another to make it fourth down on the 4-yard line. Then, with perfect protection, Alvey drop kicked the slender new ball for the winning points. A few minutes later, Wood ended the game on his back on the 2-yard line in the last chapter of the Spoots. When Ducky Pond and Greasy Neal took over the coaching in 1934, they faced what the newspapers called a suicide schedule. But the name of a wisecracking sophomore, Larry Kelly, soon became familiar. And building from the ground up, the coaches developed a smooth, single-wing attack featuring clever ball handling and deceptive reverses. This began to gel in a 37 to nothing victory over Brown. And the record was unexpectedly good going into the Princeton game. But Princeton had won 15 in a row, and already their students were petitioning to go to the Rose Bowl to give their great team a chance against some real opposition. When Captain Claire Curtin kicked off, Sandback's bobble in the end zone didn't worry the Tigers. But after some more of their fumbling, Yale guard Ben Groskup asked Princeton if they thought the Rose Bowl had handles on it. And then came the play no one will forget. Jerry Roscoe threw high, and Larry Kelly went into the sky to spear the ball. He looted a circle of tacklers, outran another, faked out two more, and went over, standing up. For comfort, Curtin added the extra point, but Princeton still expected their power to tell. In the second quarter, Princeton's Gary Levan, a fine back, broke loose from the Tiger 28-yard line, and only a great save by Choo Choo Train stopped him. From there, Levan threw to McMillan on the Yale 5. First down. Levan for no gain. Spofford crashed to the two. Constable hit a blue wall for nothing. And the Yale line simply hurled the whole Princeton team for a two-yard loss. No team ever made a more magnificent stand. In the second half, fine kicking by Stan Fuller kept the Tiger close to his goal line. The score stood, Yale 7, Princeton nothing. And 11 iron men did the job. Kelly, Wright, Morton, 
Grosscup, Whitehead, DeAngelis, Roscoe, Curtin, Fuller, Scott, and Train. Next year, six of these men were gone, but the season was hardly underway when a group of sophomores gave notice of things to come. Penn was ahead seven to nothing when Clint Frank made the first of his many great runs. it seven to six. But Penn scored twice more to make it 20 to six. It looked like a runaway until another sophomore, Al Hesburgh, got into the act. On a wide reverse, the Rose Bowl play for 58 yards. Then with Webb Davis throwing a key block, up the center for 68 to make the score, Penn 20, Yale 18. The third sophomore, Charlie Ewart, put Yale ahead with a 48 yard pass to the veteran Larry Kelly. Meantime, another veteran, Choo Choo Train, gave a classic example of defensive end play. First, he fights off the interference. One, two, three, and gets the ball carry. Then, with mud all over his jersey, he follows around to the other end and oomph! A real masterpiece on two successive plays. After Captain Kim Whitehead intercepted a pass and carried to the 12-yard line, Ewart again teamed up with Kelly for the clincher. Yale 31, Penn 20. This was an era of spectacular plays, like Larry Kelly's famous fumble kick against Navy in 1936. Tony Mott hunted for Yale, and Navy's Schmidt fumbled on the 23-yard line. Kelly's foot sent it on to the three, and Kelly, alert as usual, picked it up and carried it over. All legal, except the score. The ball was dead at the point of recovery. Legal, that is, if it was an accident. But was it an accident? Look again and see for yourself. Result, the rules were changed. A kicked fumble is now dead where it is kicked. And it won the game because Frank scored the touchdown soon after. The 1936 Princeton game was almost the most spectacular of all. With some fine running by Jay White, Princeton ran up a 16 to nothing lead in the first two quarters. Princeton punt. He threaded his way 50 yards to the Princeton 35 yard line to put Yale back in the game. Then Clint Frank threw to Flick Hoxton for 18 yards. Frank plunged for four. And on a carefully planned delayed reverse around left end, Al Wilson went all the way to the one foot line. From there, Frank bowled over. 
Princeton 16, Yale 7. In the third quarter, Al Hesper broke through a hole opened by Beckwith, Wright, and Bill John and went 20 yards to make it 16-14. And soon afterwards, with 10 to go on a third down at the Yale 40, Frank faded to the 25 and threw 50 yards to Kelly, who blotted out the speedy white to put Yale ahead 20 to 16. One of Kelly's most amazing plays. He knew that white was fast enough to catch him, so he had to get rid of him, which he did, and completely, what the old timers called brushing off. In the fourth quarter, the Tigers roared back into the lead, 23-20, and the chips were really down. With 81 yards to go from the 19, Yale went to work. Frank to Kelly, what a pair of names. 38 yards to the Princeton 43. Wilson on a weak side reverse to the 13. Frank on a great effort. Veering off right tackle and driving with tremendous power into the corner. Yale 26, Princeton 23. With seconds to go, Princeton was still dangerous. White broke into the clear and only a magnificent tackle by Al Wilson saved the game. A deliriously exciting victory. Next week against Harvard, Kelly caught a 42-yard fourth down pass from Frank for the 15th and last touchdown of his career and completed his record of scoring in every big three game he played. American, winner of the Heisman Trophy, quite a player. Against Dartmouth in 1937, Dave Caldwell kicked the longest punt in the bowl's long history. It left his foot at the eight-yard line, sailed 70 yards through the air, and rolled out on the seven, 85 yards in all. Immediately afterward, Johnny Miller and Clint Frank broke through to Smear Hutchinson in the end zone and put Yale ahead two to nothing. But in the fourth quarter, Dartmouth's great Bob McLeod intercepted a pass and went 82 yards. A brilliant run. And Dostal's 24-yard field goal pretty much put the game on ice. Dartmouth 9, Yale 2. In fact, there was time for only one more play. When Frank passed to Hesburgh, and Hesburgh pulled another of his fine runs as the clock ran out, Dartmouth 9, Yale 8. He could have heard a pin drop as Gil Humphrey kicked the tying point and kept the team unbeaten. Against Princeton, Frank made four touchdowns. including a 79-yard cut around right end on the first play from scrimmage. And a 51-yard burst down the middle as the team rolled up the 28 to nothing victory. So Clint Frank brought his team to Harvard undefeated. That year, Harvard's crafty coach, Dick Harlow, introduced a new defense featuring looping linemen. And in the rain and mud, Yale lost. But with his knee injured and swollen, Frank was greater than ever in defeat. 
Reversing his usual role, he made a magnificent catch of a pass from Ewart, an inspiring effort. Al Hesburgh also turned in his last great runs. Off tackle for 28 yards. And again for 27 to the Harvard two-yard line. Where Frank took the ball and hurled himself over to cap a 67-yard run. After that, Clint made innumerable saving tackles, even after he could barely stand. he received simply confirmed what everyone felt. No one ever upheld the traditions of American football in a finer way.